All right, seems like seems like we are live. Hello, everyone. This is David, as you can see here. Um, and today's stream is going to be on the topic of why young men are becoming orthodox. But before I get into that topic, I want to talk about mainly the Larpodox accusations. Um, the just kind of tackle that. But even prior to that, I'm gonna just talk about briefly about some of the stuff that I guess I can address uh, before the stream show. Just some new things. Um, first thing I want to say is if you have not seen my um, YouTube community post yet, uh, a new article is out by me on the topic of the Sacred Heart. Those of you know that I already have a couple of videos, so you're gonna say, why even bother? I'll just watch those videos. This is the most complete treatment. Okay, this is the most complete treatment um, I have done on this topic. Um, some people are going to kind of say, oh, he's just repeating the same arguments over and over and over again, etc., etc. Um, so the two main things that are new is that there's a, there's a closer analysis of Roman Catholic um, encyclical statements on the topic. Alcturum Fide and Hauritius Alquas. I already quoted them a little bit, but the main new thing is the theological aspect, which I haven't really gone too deep into that uh, in any video or anything really, but the theological aspect from the Christological debates in the in the fifth century between Saint Cyril of Alexandria and Nestorius and Diodore of Tarsus, and that's been something that I have introduced, and I, I've even used Saint Theodore the Studite's kind of paradigmatic understanding of icon iconography, which is strange, but it's actually very applicable to this situation as well so if you haven't checked that out i would recommend checking that out um another i guess another news is that i suppose i'm the leader <laughs> the new uh i'm the new owner of the orthodox christian discord so nothing really much is going to change um but that's just pretty much the if you haven't joined yet go ahead but i will say you know at the end of the day it's just a discord server um, I think the most important thing is that you go to an Orthodox church, right? I'd rather go have you become Orthodox and go to an Orthodox church, be baptized or chrismated, um, than you joining the server. Both is good, but you join the Orthodox church is obviously the thing that actually matters, right? So that's why why, we, why I, at least personally, do these things. Um, just generally, last couple of days, it's been a bit, uh, I suppose... I've been pretty tired today, for example, but hopefully I can explain myself properly in the stream and hopefully you can enjoy. We can have a nice, engaging stream on this topic. Having said all of this, let's talk about, and, and I hope you can hear me. It seems like my audio is fine. If you have any questions regarding this topic or maybe another topic, you can super chat, but I will try to be engaging with the live chat and someone says are you going to bring back news channel my friend i am the reason the channel is gone i don't think it's going to come back um anyways let's begin so the first thing i want to talk about as i said before is the larpodox accusation um so what is larping for those who don't know larping is just a short version of live action role playing it's where you pretend to be a character that you're just not Right? You just pretend to be something that you're not. And usually it's understood as, well, for example, maybe you just enact a medieval battle scene with a couple of people and you know that's LARPing. Or maybe you play D&D &D and you create a character, you're LARPing. Or um, you, know, you go to you know, a model United Nations conference. That's pretty specific. But, you know, and you pretend you basically end up being a delegate of like Brazil, for example, in some disarmament council. That's LARPing. Okay, that is LARPing. So then what, what it means to be a LARPer, pretty much if you're Orthodox, it basically means that really you become Orthodox for a superficial reason. You're not actually, properly speaking, Orthodox. And the extreme word is kind of as well, you're not XYZ ethnicity. You can never really be fully Orthodox. You'll never be fully acceptable. Now, I want to note this accusation. I have been Orthodox... I think between three and four years of my life, I've never seen a single person, single Orthodox person, make this accusation or argument. Not a single one. Maybe there's one person and he's in, he's in 
he's a guy who's obsessed with Macedonia. He's some idiot Greek guy on Twitter who doesn't even care about his religion. So, you know, who will even care what he thinks, right? But um, I've never had a single Orthodox Christian actually say that, right? So this accusation is something that's more from the opposite side, from the heterodox, from those who are not Orthodox. So it's mostly you hear this from Roman Catholics, Protestants, sometimes atheists, sometimes. And most of the time they don't. It's it's a lot more innocent, you can say, like that kind of say, oh, why orthodoxy? Is that kind of interesting? Like that's kind of like the attitude they take. Whereas Roman Catholics usually, ah, oh, you're only orthodox because you think Russia is based, right? Like something like that. You're only you know you're part of an exotic religion because you hate the West or like stuff like that, right? This is a regular accusation you hear all the time. Um, at least I have heard it all the time in the recent years. I've heard it all the time in YouTube. I've heard it all the time in Instagram. I've heard it all the time on Twitter. I've heard it all the time on Discord. I've heard it a lot of times everywhere. It's a very regular accusation. Um, an example I want to bring, and this is an insane example, but this Protestant person who is some irrelevant sect, like just literally an irrelevant 18th century sect, who cares? Um, I think SD, Seventh-day Adventist or something like that. Um, he made a thread about oh, uh, uh, posting the picture of someone on Twitter who, you know, who's orthodox and it's like a very orthodox bio, right? It's like full, full of that. And he's like, oh, a case study in LARPing. And he's like talking about how like they get orthodox Christians in his like Protestant SDA discord server. He's a Janian, which I guess I can't say anything. I'm King Janny, but he's like Janny of like 200 people right like i'm a janny of eight thousand people so i guess i i'm just joking but he's like you know he's some janny in a discourse so he's like oh we occasionally get these orthodox guys and uh they're larpers i don't like them that's basically the whole trip right that's like the message of the whole trip now the guy he's like posting a picture of that guy's a reader in an orthodox church like he's he actually does go to church he prays he's been baptized he's not a larper but he still gets tagged as a larper why because he is white and he's Western. That's basically the only reason he's getting tagged. And he likes the religion. And the religion is exotic, according to these people, because, oh, it's Eastern. It's a Eastern Christianity. But Western Christianity, you either have Protestantism or Roman Catholicism. That's pretty much how these people think. And part of that is due to anti-Roman Empire propaganda. And I'm talking about Byzant anti-Byzantine propaganda. There is part of that reason. I'm not going to get into that. But part of that is that reason. That has its roots in the 8th century, 9th century specifically. But another part of that is because of this idea of traditionalism, where really traditionalism is just returning to your roots, right? And uh, a lot of people make fun of the pagans, for example, for making this argument, because then they was, ha, 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 your ancestors were Christian. So really, if you were really traditionalist, you should be Christian. But they kind of make the same argument by saying, oh, ha, 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 um, you're Orthodox Christian, but your ancestors were Quakers. Your ancestors were Lutherans. Your ancestors were Roman Catholics. Like, that's what they will, for example. So it's really the same kind of argument, right? So the irony is really not seen there. But uh, the craziest instance, to really hammer my point, all these are real instances I've seen on Twitter, by the way. I'm not making any of them up. I'm, I can't be bothered to, like, pull up, right? Pull it up. Jamie, pull that, pull that Twitter post, right? I can't do, I'm not going to do that. But uh, is that I saw, so this is a person I wanted to my stream, George. And we talked about, you know, monarchy and such. He's, he's Russian. So he made a post at, like, that is pro-Russian, right? Um, just a general pro-Russian post. I think it was like a map of Russia and NATO bases surrounding it in a Bible verse. And some guy quote tweeted that and said, oh, the pro-Russia LARPing is so ridiculous. The fact that that has happened has shown that this has gone too far. There's, there's something really off about this accusation of LARPing. Because if a, pro, if a Russian person gets called a LARPer for posting something pro-Russian, there's seriously something wrong. I don't think I need to explain to you how that's wrong, right? That's like saying that, like, I suppose... That's like saying that a Greek is LARPing for, you know, doing a Greek dance. Like, it's pretty much like, that's basically on that category. I mean, it's, it's just totally ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, why did this go this far? Part of the reason 
is of the of the LARP accusation is that um, Orthodox Christianity and kind of like these circles have kind of come out of nowhere. It kind of made this big run, and it's kind of like heavily convert led, and so it's a very easy accusation to make. Oh well, there, there's two different religions here. There's a convert doxy and then there's cradle doxy. Cradle people are like the they, 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 they talk like, oh, the cradle guys, they're like the nice guys. They're like the actual Orthodox Christians. And they're the ones, they never talk about theological differences. That's probably because they've never bothered to check it. They never felt the need to do so. But anyways, whereas these converts, all they talk about is theology. All they do is, well, maybe that's because they had to make the decision between different religions. And it was on the, the space. So maybe that's the reason they talk about it all the time. I don't know. Sounds like a crazy idea to me. But might be possible um anyways uh i'm not being sarcastic here obviously that's pretty much why that's the case but and is, does that go too far of course right but nevertheless the point that i'm trying to trying to make here is um <clears throat> is there there really is no reason to attach that critique um for example a lot of uh, people accuse for example they say oh the Greeks hate people like you. Russians hate people like you. Now, let me get into a little anecdotal storytelling and then anecdotal storytelling from other Orthodox Christians to show that this is not the case. Right? Obviously, it's not going to be a study. And obviously, anecdotal evidence is not like the final evidence or anything like that. But let me, for example, I am a Turkish person. I have a Turkish name. My family is Turkish. We have you know, Turkish Muslim roots, okay? And I used to be anti that. I used to be against that prior to becoming Orthodox. After becoming Orthodox, I mellowed down and, and I ended up eventually saying, well, yes, I'm ethnically, maybe I'm not, not maybe, I'm probably not Central Asian, not like that, but culturally speaking, in terms of name, the, that kind of heritage, yeah. I mean, I was a citizen of the Ottoman Empire. I was being, my ancestors were called Turks. So, I was fine with accepting that, right? Um, so whenever I went somewhere, I always said I'm Turkish. I didn't say I'm this ethnicity, this weird stuff. I used to do that. Again, I stopped doing that. I did that in, for example, um, you know, when I, I went to Sweden a couple of months ago, Serbian parish, three Serbian priests, you know the meme, Serbia hates Turks. Ha ha ha. You know, funny, funny joke. I went there and they, and they asked me, where are you from? And I said, I'm, I'm from Turkey. I'm Turkish. You know, so, oh, you, your family too? And it's like, yeah, yeah. And did they say, get out here, stinking Turk. You can't be Orthodox. You, should, you don't belong here. No. Um, instead, the priest said, that's beautiful, right? Or I went to a Russian parish and I, and I saw an American couple in this fresh Russian parish. And, you know, it's mostly Russian-speaking people. Of course, there's Georgians, etc., and did they say to me and to them, oh, you're American, you're Turkish, you don't belong here? No. You know what they said? Oh, you guys are, you guys come from Roman Catholicism. Oh, you come from this country. Oh, wow, that's so, that's so amazing. Glory to God. That's what they say. All of them say this. Oh, glory to God that he has shown the truth to you. Because Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, is a universal faith. Now, again, what does universal mean? Does it mean that uh, to prove it, you have to, like, this Sentinelese people have to be Christian too, to, in order to prove that too. No, but it's universal in the sense for it says that it is for all mankind, right? It's for all mankind. So whatever jurisdiction you go to, that still remains the case. And remember, these are not parishes that were like convert heavy parishes. These were like ethnic heavy parishes. And that's still their attitude. And any Orthodox I talk to, they say the same things. Now, sometimes people complain about Greeks. But I personally think that's mostly because part of that reason is because I think that's misunderstanding. Other than part of the reason is that it's kind of like blowing it out of pro 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 proportion, right? Um, but there are, even if there's individual instances where it does, yes, occasionally happen, well, guess what? I mean, there's instances of anything happening in any religion, right? The point is, is this a regular occurrence? Absolutely not. It's not a regular occurrence because the fundamental basis of the Orthodox Christian faith is that it is for all mankind, right? And that's how these people understood, understand it. But the reason why this accusation gets thrown around is because of the, well, there's Greek Orthodox, there's Serbian Orthodox, there's this Orthodox, that Orthodox, Georgian, Bulgarian. 
Well, that's due to, again, jurisdictional lines and the cities that they were just from, and also the language of the parish as well, right? So um, that's pretty much the main understanding behind it. It's really referring to the jurisdiction, right? What jurisdiction is this church under, right? So it's, if it's like a Serbian church, it's under the jurisdiction of a Serbian patriarch. That's what it means, right? Um, does this mean this church is for Serbians only? Absolutely not. That's not what it means. And if you look at history, I mean, um, the Slavs were evangelized by Saints Kirill and Methodius, and they went as far as to have make them an alphabet. We have Church Slavonic today used in, you know, Russian liturgies and, and Slavic liturgies still to this day, right? So these people went that far. They went so far as to do that for these people. And this attitude still carries out today. Um, you know, you can look at, for example, saints. There's many Turkish saints, for example. And in fact, I have a video entirely on that. So that, I think, is kind of sufficient enough to explain this kind of like, oh, ethnic religion nonsense. It's really nonsensical. You can use that to any religion. So you can use that to Islam. Okay, why is in Islam do you have to learn Arabic culture, right? Many Turks, for example, complain about that. They say, oh, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm Muslim, but uh, I'm not an Arabic Muslim. That's what they say. For example, oh, I'm not like these uh, monkeys. Like they literally, it's like Habesh Maimun. They use that term. I don't know what's that exactly in English, but um, that's those are like people who really hate Arabs, right? But the, but the point, basic point is like, oh, you know, I'm yeah. Like they don't say they're Turkish Muslim or anything like that, obviously. But the point is that these kind of intercultural differences are very major in different religions as well. The same with Roman Catholicism. Same with a lot of religions and. You know, orthodoxy is not beyond these problems because orthodoxy is not a religion that claims that these problems are not going to exist, right? These issues, problems and issues always exist in different religions. This is due to the fact that the world is fallen due to sin. And so problems like this happen. That's natural. But what matters, and I, I saw a really good quote from Father Serpent Rose today on, as I was browsing on the, on the Twitter pages. I think this was from, uh, it was, I want to get the direct quote and read it to you because it really, really, really gets to the point very strongly. There it is. Uh, how can a religious seeker avoid the traps and deceptions? Really good motorbiking. Every time I stream, there's a motorbiker or a car that's like really loud. How can a religious seeker avoid the traps and deceptions which he encounters in his search? There is only one answer to this question. A person must be in the religious search, not for the sake of religious experiences, which can deceive, but for the sake of truth. So that's what Father Seraphim Rose says. Um, so I think that kind of gets the point. That's the main focus, is that the LARPing accusation, the problem with that is that it fundamentally points out, and the main issue with it is that when you make a generalized accusation of you're not this ethnicity, you can't be orthodox. You're not this ethnicity, you can't be that religion. Is that religion stops being transcendent, stops being overarching, and becomes a thing that is merely on the level of culture. Religion becomes just an aspect of culture. Merely an aspect. Now, is, is there a cultural aspect of religion? Of course there is. It does, does religion also transcend cultural boundaries? Yes, it does. It's simultaneous. It's both. It's not an either or. And a lot of people don't, don't understand that. It's the same reason. Another example is that, for example, um, Christians, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, are willing to say that God is beyond existence. It's a regular thing that we say. But we also say God exists. So is God beyond existence or does he exist? It's both, right? Um, being beyond existence doesn't contradict existing. Right? Existence is still a characteristic of God. And so we as Orthodox will say that, you know, existence is an energy of God, whereas uh, being beyond existence, being super essential divinity is proper to his essence, right? His divine essence that is beyond our reach that we cannot understand. So um, we as Orthodox will explain it in that way. And so having that scope, we can also un explain certain things that seemingly are either or that are actually both ends. So, for example, again, culture. Orthodox Christianity transcends culture, but you will notice it can also integrate itself with any culture in a very good way. In fact, in my video on Introduction to Forgotten Christianity, Malachi Martin says this is Orthodoxy's weakness, right? 
And he argues that Roman Catholicism's strength is that it is very good at making the different cultures one, right? So the kind of point of like, you know, Latin, right? You know, Latin is what is used because it's reversing the Tower of Babel. The problem of the Tower of Babel is its diversity that should be eliminated and we should return to unity, right? That's kind of like the basic idea that you see in these um some of these people, right? Again, like Malachi Martin, uh, the quote is in the introduction to Forgotten Christianity video. If you want to check that out yourself, that goes much more deeper into detail in this topic. But yeah, I think that pretty much covers everything I wanted to discuss so far with, with regards to LARPing specifically. Oh, wow, we got 80 people here. Okay. Certainly, that's not going to make me excited a little bit or panic. But, um, but, yeah, so right now, so far, is that I think Devada Truth is correct. David is addressing the actual LARPing accusation, not the tendency of new converts having overzealous behavior, which I'm going to be talking about that too. So just because I'm criticizing the accusations doesn't mean are there people that aren't actually LARPing or are super overzealous, etc. Yes, there are. And we're going to be talking about that too. I just want to kind of like basically kind of get at, first of all, let's understand that these accusations are baseless. They're too general. And if, you know, they can be particular, they can be just particular for one person. But at that stage, it just stops being an argument against orthodoxy and just becomes against that person. At that stage, that's not really the scope of this video in the sense of responding to it, in the sense of rehabilitating people who are overzealous. Again, this video is, we're going to be talking about that, right? That's still going to be important. That's still part of my radar. But I will say that so far, I think I have covered the main accusation. So, uh, let's growing eyebrows is LARPing. Um, yeah. So next I want to talk about, I think I want to, I want to make sure. Okay. Stage two is why young men become orthodox. I'm just writing notes for myself. So I don't forget stage three, um, advice to overzealous all right and my my keyboard died again all right so let's talk about why young men become orthodox in the first place and again these are not going to be merely anecdotal it's going to be much more fundamental deeper than that level right so a lot of people are getting interested in traditional things traditionalism generally speaking uh, i was I refer to myself as a traditionalist, for example, in 2016, right? I would be like, well, I'm first and foremost a traditionalist, even though I didn't really live that kind of a life, did I? But uh, a lot of people, and there's various different reasons. The basic reason is that society is going to the pooper. Everything that is normal has been rejected as abnormal and extreme. It has all been rejected. It has all been considered to be part of something evil, and it's being totally demonized, whereas totally utterly abnormal behavior that should take no place in society are becoming the new normal and men are taking the brunt of it because anything that is considered to be masculine behavior like being energetic if you're a child and you're energetic you're being told that hey you kid you're too energetic you might have adhd here let me drug you that's basically what's happening right if you for example maybe you're sad about the state of the world and you know the world is super abnormal and you cannot have fun you cannot socialize you cannot relate to anyone around you you cannot express who you are properly speaking even to yourself in your own closet that is in your own heart not a closet as in the that closet right I'm talking about inner you in inner yourself that is going to mess you up and when you get messed up again what is the solution oh he has severe psychological problems must be hormonal imbalances here let me drug you and make you feel happy it's pretty much what happens women take this brunt extremely ssris etc i i must have have seen known women that take ssris and it's like it's a miserable existence okay these the mood swings all right people talk about mood swings all the time a lot of that is due to the hormonal imbalances due to the drugs themselves right but again, because we have this materialistic view and because we have a secular view where we don't think about religion, we don't think about overarching fundamental concepts of reality, we think, oh, it's just uh, chemical movements, right? Humanity is just a bunch of chemical movements. That's what matters. 
Uh, so we need to change that. So we need to adjust that and manipulate that. That's pretty much how people think. And once that's the case, you know, you go to school, you look around yourself, everyone is miserable, but you can't relate to anyone. You really feel like you're, you have no place in society, right? You're always being told that you have, you have advantages as a man, right? You know, male privilege or your white privilege or, you know, even, you know, even in a society like mine where we don't have that kind of BS, it's still, you know, you see in the news, Oh, a woman, this woman got, you know, assaulted, etc. Constant news and constant agitation. And this, this feeling of, you know, young men feel true culture by t television shows, by the parents, by the news media. They're constantly and constantly told that they are the villains. They are the villains. We are the villains. We screw this world up. Really, it will be better if it was weren't even born. Pretty much what they end up thinking. And so they think, okay, so the problem is that these men are just mean to people. So instead of being like these mean, racist, sexist, xenophobes, I'm going to be the nice guy. And then they become nice guys and they realize it doesn't work. Everyone tramples over them or just walks over them. Everyone treats them like trash. And over time, they realize that really everyone treats me like trash because I guess that I am trash. Uh, I am not perfect. Therefore, I will be taking my life shortly. That's the average mental process of a man today. So what is the solution? For this man well something needs to change and many people think that the change must be again due to material means so someone might take the andrew tate approach just make a lot of money okay uh, be a man whore have sex with a lot of women and eventually you know okay you might still have problems but at least you have expressed yourself you do what you want right just follow your body follow your passions just will to power do what you want some people think all right i'm gonna be this crazy nerd about this thing to escape from the world so they become gamers or they maybe research some things and it drives them into a deep rabbit hole about some things and they learn some things about the world and suddenly it's like uh oh what is this going on i didn't know about this i didn't know about the world economic forum hey you know why are these uh really why are these people who have the same agenda they have very similar surnames i mean it's kind of strange isn't it um, you know, they come across a lot of different facts that they just couldn't come across from just watching mainstream media, just listening to their parents. And they start to think certain things about the world. So really what happens then is that they realize the matrix, the mainstream world is a lie. It's fake. It's not true. It's not real. I need to get out of it. And so that's why something needs to change. And eventually then there's a, there's a third category there's a schizo category, then there's a third category. They realize that really I need to start thinking about what this world actually is. So they start to philosophize. They start to think. They start to ask themselves, well, what is the purpose of doing anything? What is the purpose of being happy? What is the purpose of uh, researching these things? What is the purpose of reading and trying to learn about people, what is the purpose? what's the reason for all of this? And this usually leads people to religion, to meaning. Because religion is a domain where the answers to questions such as, what is the meaning of life? Um, what is uh, the center and basis of reality? What is the answer to reality? What is truth? All of these questions, they're not answered by political beliefs. Kind of try to answer the question of what is true. Try to answer the question of what is the ultimate reality. A political belief is not going to give you that. It's only going to give you what's below that. That is, what is on here. But you want to go above that. Well, some people don't even believe that there's above that in the first place. But people who believe that there is that in the first place, they will start thinking, okay, religion. Really, my problems stem from religiosity. And really, the problem for everyone is the lack of religiosity of everyone around me. I remember in high school, I, you know, I was, I was secular. I was basically somewhere between, you know, agnostic. You know, I was basically an agnostic, something between agnosticism and agnostic theism, um, which is a re real thing, by the way. Obviously, agnosticism is actually not a philosophically tenable position, but nevertheless, for a lot of people, that's the thing that seems reasonable, right? Just saying, I don't know, right? Uh, although agnostic really means that we cannot know, which is a very different claim, right? Uh, nevertheless, I remember using, I used to have these conversations with my friends in high school. Uh, we used to say things like, oh, you know, uh, well, 
religion, when you really think about it, it's a necessity. Whether it's true or not, you know, it's a necessity because it gives you laws, it gives you rules, it gives people something to follow. You know, it's just that like, you know, whether you like it or not, that's just what it is. And like, we used to have this like very posh air about it. It's like, I mean, we know religion is ridiculous, but it's necessary. It's in an ideal society. You, you're going to need it. Like, that's kind of how we thought of it. And we didn't really think much of it, but it made me realize that really the reason why it's necessary, the reason why it helps people, it's not because no one is capable of coming up with their own reasons. They are capable of coming up with their own reasons. The problem is the reasons they come up with, low quality people, for example, according to society, they come up with reasons to think that, well, I guess crime is the answer to my life, or at least immoral acts is the answer to my life. So you really cannot judge them on the basis of the atheistic paradigm. You really cannot, right? Because he's operating under that same paradigm, not something above it, right? And you yourself admit that that paradigm, that ground level that you're walking on, that's just relative. That's not objective. Objective is the higher realm, you see. So a lot of people, where they have these political views, like, for example, oh, well, you know, I have this patriotic traditionalist view. But what's the point of being one if I'm not preserving something that is beyond this existence? And this is what leads people to religion. So when people get led to religion, usually the people who get led to religion in this manner happen to be right-wing people. Why? Because the current paradigm is of a left-wing paradigm. What is the left-wing paradigm? It is characterized by certain beliefs such as atheism or secularism, uh, relativism, right? Uh, the lack of exclusionary identities. So for example, open borders, right? Exclusion, right? Defining yourself, just open society basically, right? Ironically, open society itself is excluding themselves from closed societies. So really, they themselves are exclusionary, but that doesn't matter. That might be a contradictory, but that doesn't matter. Why? Because ultimately for these people, well, logic is a higher order, but higher order doesn't exist. So it's all relative. So what does really matter? Power. So it's just all about power. And a lot of young men, they don't have any power. They don't have any economic power. That's why people like Andrew Tate, they try to, let me show, let me get you economic power to like get to that level. They don't have economic power, they don't have social power, they don't have social skills, right? They're not able to talk to people to get what they want, whether it's from women or from other men, they're incapable, so they only resort to online. Uh, they're incapable of really having anything to back up and give a solid foundation for themselves. And once people realize that, that's when they become religious. And these people tend to be right-wing. These people tend to care about being traditional. These people tend to care about things that last for a long time. So the characteristic of many young men, the characteristics is that they, they want something that is foundational. So it doesn't change. It doesn't change because of the popular view, right? What do a lot of relativists say? Oh, well, back then that was normal, according to that society. Now it isn't. Immorality is relative. Now it isn't. We got to just change with the times. So back then that was immoral, but now it is. Now we know this action is a normal thing to do. People see that and they realize how stupid this is. So you're telling me that truth, logic, these things change over time and you just come up with new things? That's totally ridiculous. So what they want is something that doesn't change. Solid foundation can trace its origin back since the beginning of time, at the very least theoretically, conceptually speaking, right? That has a history, something that really does answer these questions. And when it does answer these questions, it doesn't just answer them in like in a very lame way. I was like, oh, I just believe in God, just blind faith. Some people are attracted to that, but most of these people, they want something stronger than that, right? Something stronger than that. So they also want this foundational thing to kind of be in line with their current political views. And the reason is, well, when I see all of these people who attack good things, well, the true religion cannot support these people. It's pretty much what they think. So it also has to be against the world. And the world has, also, has to be against them. So you can very clearly see but there's one specific religion that fits the bill very perfectly, and that's Christianity. Christianity fits the bill perfectly. 
That's why most of these people become Christians. Now, are there people that do become pagans? Of course there are. I've seen them myself. I talked to them myself. I experienced these people myself. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of these pagans fall to the same trap. They don't go to that higher mode, right? And a lot of them kind of have comical beliefs that I'm not going to repeat because that will get me banned on YouTube. I don't want to talk about that. But um, nevertheless, Christianity is the main religion that seems very handsome here, especially for a lot of Western men. It's very beautiful here. That's why there's a lot of people that become Christian. They mostly become Roman Catholic. And part of that is because um, a certain person that I guess YouTube doesn't like me to name, but you can probably guess who this person is. Uh, he has really done an excellent job. As much as I, I'm not a fan of this person anymore, he has done an excellent job at synthesizing political beliefs with religious beliefs in a at the very least somewhat performative level that for a lot of people really is, was like this is amazing this is exactly what we needed this is the answer to everything now of course that organization is a freaking shit show but nevertheless the, the concept is beautiful it really does work and it has made a lot of people roman catholics it made a lot of people even orthodox christians it really has turned a lot of people to christianity because even the concretization of this idea even if the execution is really not that good a lot of people really like that. So this is fundamentally, I will say, the reason why a lot of people, young men become Christians. Now, why do they become Orthodox Christians then? Well, the answer is really, this, again, the same questions, the same reasons. It is because they look at Orthodox Christianity. What do they see? They see doctrines don't change. They look at Roman Catholicism and they say, okay, the Pope is the head of the religion. Okay, that's fine. Right? Well, first of all, they look at Roman Catholicism. The first thing they say, wow. Western civilization, this shaped the world. And the only thing that stands is the Roman Catholic Church, Vatican. That's the only thing that stands. That's the only thing that we can clutch onto and hold on to and say, I'm going to stick with you, right? And when I talk about Western civilization, I'm talking about traditional Western civilization, not the Western civilization that led to what you know, modernism and liberalism. That is usually associated with Protestantism. Right? So there's kind of that kind of a political... Like, for example, most Protestants today are not monarchists. They're not monarchists. I've never seen a monarchist Protestant. Not a single one. There's a very good reason why that's the case, right? Uh, but I see many Ro uh, monarchist Roman Catholics because they're more willing to have those beliefs. Most right-wing Protestants tend to be the more libertarian, you know, American Republican, European right wing kind of people, right? That's mostly what, well, in Europe, they tend to be left wing, to be honest. But, anyways, uh, <clears throat> whereas, but whereas they look at certain things about Roman Catholicism, it looks beautiful, standing thing about Western civilization, but then they realize, well, wait a second, is it really? Because, for example, they see the papacy and they think, oh, well, okay, well, I guess that makes sense. You need a monarchy and in and, and religious matters. But then they see certain things. Okay, Newman's doctrine of evolution of dogma. And you see that you they hear the Roman Catholic apologists and they hear them say things like, Oh, well, this issue, well, this issue developed, right? Uh so papacy. Oh, it didn't really exist in the first millennium. It evolved over time. They hear these things and they think to themselves, how is that any different from the modern world that I live in? It seems like the modern world really is the actualization of the answer that I'm looking at. It seems like this is not even the answer. And so they have two main things to do. Number one is that they say, all right, I'm going to make the decision. Fate, religion, I'm putting you in this box. You are going to stay here, okay? Reason, you know, my life and, and political matters, you go here. You remain here, I handle you. Religion, you're the backbone, okay? You stay here, you're different, you stay here. You don't interfere with these matters. You don't interfere with rash, so they basically take a fidious approach, right? You don't interfere with these matters. I'm just going to have faith. I'm just going to ha have faith in the church. Blind faith. I don't need to look at these documents, these theological controversies, these arguments. I don't need to do that. Just blind faith, and that's it. So a lot of Roman Catholics, even if not explicitly, have implicitly taken that approach. I've seen that myself. They are they are very willing to do to talk to talk smack, 
But when you return it to them, they'll say, oh, well, it's beyond, it's beyond me, right? It's beyond my capacity or something like that. That's when the excuses come in. Um, and the second option is that I guess it's not going to be Roman Catholicism, right? That's what the second option is. And so they end up choosing, most of the time, the other option is then, well, I guess I have to check that Orthodox Church now, don't I? And they check it and they realize, wow, this, this whole thing like gives this mystical impression, this, this actual mystical impression. Like you are there, you don't understand what's going on, but you know that the moment you walk in, you are in some, some place that's beyond you, right? And it gives you that aesthetic feeling that you long for, that you want, that you had in Roman Catholic Church and you also have in the Orthodox Church without the repercussions of the internal problems that you have in your mind that doesn't match up with reality, right? So this is why a lot of young men become Orthodox Christians, right? This is the number one motivation. This is fundamentally what their thought process is, how they think of things, even if they don't process it in their mind, that's how they reach to those conclusions, right? But they understand also that it's not just some mystical, you know, aesthetic feeling. That's not, not that only. It's just that, again, it's a fight against the world, but it also has a backing of tradition, and it also kind of makes sense, right? It also kind of makes sense. It seems like it's something that is something that's really needed and seems really reasonable, right? And um, I will say that kind of generally is a very good summary of how young men become orthodox. Um, if there's anything that I have, um, I have missed, I'm going to check the chat to see if there is a interesting comment. Um, because yeah, so which is why someone says this is true, uh, which is why things like aesthetics or tradition are not enough to become Christian, right? So we need to kind of make, so what I'm saying here is not an argument why you should be orthodox, right? That's a different topic. The arguments that I'm, the, the things that I'm saying here is explaining, well, what's the tough process? Why do these people become orthodox Christian? And you will notice that the tough process and the reason to become part of religion are actually very different things. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Let me just get into a social butterfly mode, selfish social butterfly mode. I'm going to talk about my own life, my own tough process a little bit, okay? So... Uh, I was incredibly cringe. I hated my identity. I kind of disliked my family. And as a cope, I basically said, looked at my ethnic roots and I said, well, it seems to be the case that my ethnic roots is Greek, right? So ethnic roots is Byzantine. That's like the cradle of civilization. So I'm going to try to be like that. And I realized, oh, well, the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire was also as Christian. Well, that's pretty cool. Maybe I should be one too. And I t that's why I taught process slowly and surely. I eventually approached that. And that was why I taught process. I just thought, again, like everything I said was kind of, you know, non-mentally was, I wasn't considering it, but that was part of my decision-making process. But eventually um, that was kind of like how I approached Like, oh, well, that's just what I identify with. That's just like, I'm going to like LARP as a Greek now, right? Even though I wasn't really fully into it, I still made the kind of careful distinction so that I didn't, give a wrong impression to people. But eventually, obviously, I realized that this is being a bit, a bit of, even if it's somewhat true, it's still a bit of a uh, ridiculous decision, right? So uh, I remember I was on a Greek island um, with a friend of mine, and uh, I decided to, hey, why not? I'll just buy a Christian cross necklace and I'll wear it on me. Why not? You know, it, like I'm going to that direction. If I don't become one, then it's like, whatever. It's a cool memorabilia at least, right? And, and it kind of just ended up snowballing into what it is today. So what were my initial reasons? You will notice that it's still a lot political. It's it does it's not really that much concerned about whether it's true. It's just like, well, this seems to match up with my political views because, you know, I have certain political views and I realize orthodoxy matches up perfectly with that. And I said, well, this seems like the perfect religion to be. So, hey, yay, let's go. And eventually I realized when my faith started to become challenged, I realized something very important. I can't go online on forums and discourse servers and YouTube comments and just debate people by repeating what someone says or what I search on Google, right? Debate someone 
and during a debate someone makes an argument i don't know about i google it and then i answer as if i know about it even though i have zero clue you done this i know you've done this because i've done it myself i, I know you've done this right everyone watching this you all done this at some point 100 percent. you all gone to google mid argument and copy pasted an argument and acted as if you knew about it all along don't lie to me right so I will do that kind of stuff. But eventually I realized I can't bear with this. There's just too much. I don't get it. I'm overloaded. What the heck do I do? And so I got into the dilemma I talked about before. What was the dilemma? The dilemma was between two options. Either I take the blind faith approach or I say, this is not it. I took the third approach. The third approach was understanding my limitations, understanding that everything is easy. Not everything is simple. I have to put in work. If this is a religion that really does matter, this means that I need to spend years researching, learning every single day. I need to put in work to learn about this and make this part of my life really. And part of that means I can't go to debate people, right? I learned a lot from debating people, but that can't be my main source of information because that's just not sustainable. And so I decided to myself, I told myself, I am going to actually study. I'm going to cease from these debates and I will focus on fellowship, focus on what I can already do. And eventually we will work towards answering the questions that I had. Lo and behold, we are here today. Hey, YouTube channel knows all, all of the things that I couldn't answer three years ago, four years ago. I can answer all those questions now very easily off the top of my head. And all of these questions were really actually very simple because I decided to myself, you don't know anything. And that's the third option that I think a lot of people need to do. Uh, and I think every single person, every single one of you that are new to orthodoxy watching this video or those who are becoming orthodox, you're watching this video, believe me, I know where this goes. I know how this happens. You will face this decision. This will happen to you. You will eventually become super overwhelmed. You will start to hate people because, oh, I can't answer this question and no one is helping me. I, I asked for their help 20 times, but the 21st time, they're all ignoring me. What the heck? Oh, I hate these guys. They can't answer my God. They, I can't find the answer to this question anywhere. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? This is constantly in my head rent free. Eventually, you say to yourself, well, why don't I try to find the answer myself? Why do I just... Search on Google, search with Discord, search things, try to find the things the easy way. And this is really the problem about the, the traditionalist mindset in the modern age is that a lot of people really have not adopted the traditionalist mindset, to, to be honest. A lot of people still have this mindset of easy pickings, easy information, easy ways to learn things, easy way to do things, the easy way to do that, easy way to do this. I'm going to try to find the simplest way. Look, that works perfectly if you're the CEO of Microsoft. It works perfectly um, to do things the easiest way, to do things the simplest It's efficient. But when it's about developing your character, you need to realize, okay, when you're working at a job, you want to do the simplest things because what are you investing towards? You're investing your time into making money. So of course you're going to do the simplest thing. But when you're investing in yourself, you're investing in yourself. Are you going to treat yourself as something simple that doesn't deserve attention? Are you going to invest in yourself by trying to do the easiest thing? Heck no. You're going to do the opposite. You're going to do the hard things. You're going to do the difficult things. You are going to invest in yourself and the way you're going to invest in yourself is by respecting yourself enough, by understanding all of these questions in my mind that I have, they don't have easy answers. There is no easy answer to anything, I am going to, instead of going to some guy and, hey, can you be my personal instructor for free and answer me this question? You're going to say to yourself, well, why don't I just read a book that talks about this? Why not? 100 page book, simple enough. Okay, I don't understand the incarnation. Um, why? Maybe I invest one hour into watching fully someone's video who knows about this book, or maybe I read this book myself and I don't understand what the book says. Maybe then I re refer to this book and ask, hey, what is this? I read this book and I, I didn't understand these parts. You know, can you help me out? Or maybe I should, you know, it's kind of crazy. I didn't read the Bible once in 20 years of my life. Maybe I should start reading the Bible. Maybe I should just read the Bible. I'm not going to find answers to my questions immediately. 
but it's going to develop your personality your character into allowing you to be able to come to that truth instantly very easily it will make you mature so an example of this let me give you an example um I guess Mia Physics is a good example, right? Because if you, for example, are immature and you look at like the Wikipedia, you look at the Wikipedia and you say, oh, so the debate between monophysites and diophysites and, you know, the Orthodox is that like we believe that Christ is diophysitism and they believe in Mia Physitism. And so whoever says the, the special word is the right side. And so St. Kirill of Alexandria says Mia Physis, so he says one nature, therefore the monophysites are right about it. like that's a very immature way to handle that things because it might be a lot more complex than that, right? Maybe that terminology is used, but is the concept behind it is used, or the concept of mere physics is that actually used by saying, right? When you're mature, you will understand that when you read the text, you're not gonna read everything in just mere face value. You're gonna read things at a deeper value in a holistic manner where you connect everything you read. And use that all together in your mind instantly to contextualize and understand what this passage means. Oh, I read somewhere that this can be used in multiple different ways. That's what it must mean then. Because otherwise, this person will be contradicting themselves in a very obvious manner. That I think will be ridiculous to assume. I don't think this person is contradicting themselves. For example, again, with the example of St. of Alexandria. Well, this person says that um, Christ died in his human nature. And he also says that Christ has his nature. And in strong implicate this is divine nature so to define me a physicist in this manner it seems like a very immature thing to do an unreasonable thing to do perhaps we need to think in a different way so why does he use that terminology it seems contradictory so what's the purpose behind it the moment you start thinking in this manner everything will become much more easier to understand for example oh well these orthodox christians adamantly say that the holy spirit proceeds from the father only but Scripture says the Holy Spirit has a relation with the Father and the Son. These fathers say it seems like, you know, the Holy Spirit does come from both. It seems like, you know, how do I understand this? How do I understand this? But the moment you ask yourself again, well, it can't be contradictory. So maybe the problem is with me. So I need to understand this better. This is the better road to learn. And this is how you stop from being a LARPer. You go from being a LARPer and overzealous without knowledge to zealous with knowledge because zeal without knowledge is a very dangerous poison my friend it's gonna be a massive problem for your life it's not gonna help you it's gonna ruin your life it's going to ruin your mindset it is severely going to negatively affect you and your social relationships and what it's gonna do is that you're gonna swing from one side and the other constantly with no stability i've seen numerous people on twitter do this I'm not going to name these people, but those on Twitter, you know exactly who I'm talking about. These people that constantly change and they're super immature. And the worst part is that they, they think they are the ones who are immature and that you are the one who's immature for being stable. So this kind of gets into another thing is that don't really think of your religiosity, love what, what people think. Think of it, what it matters to you, right? What it is for yourself. So I want to get to stage three. I want to get to stage three which is going to be advice to overzealous converts. Now, I made two videos, uh, which is advice to three advices to inquiries and catechumens, where I kind of go over these recommendations and I tell them things, you know, maybe you should do this, maybe you should stop doing that. So uh, we can briefly go over that, perhaps, if I still have... Um, if I still have the PowerPoint stuff. So I have the one for three more tips for inquirers but before i get into that um allow me briefly to well uh let me just get a bo bottle of water let me just get a bottle of water for a second i'll be right back in less than a minute back Back everyone, sorry that I had to leave you for 10 seconds. I know that you can't bear being without me. Anyways, <clears throat> all right. What was I talking about? All right. Uh, tips for 
inquirers uh maybe it's it was two it was two videos to two powerpoint slides but i think um i don't have that but anyways i think i can remember it so one of the things i talked about is stop being in the cage stage stage so let's talk about overzealous converts here so first of all the first thing i want to say is that anything that i'm about to say here i want you to understand first of all i myself was in your shoes according to some people i'm still in your shoes so i'm not saying this in a place of derogation um i think zeal is a very important and a beautiful thing don't let what others say distract you from re retain your zeal but remember that's not going to stay forever my friend okay look think of it as a relationship i mean literally it is a relationship i mean being orthodox is like being married to Christ's body. You become part of his body. You become one body with Christ. I mean, that's the analogy, right? So it really is like a relationship when you think about it. And when you understand that kind of relationship, it really casts relationships in a new light when you think about it. Anyways, um, oh, that's just my computer. Why is my computer going berserk mode? Whatever. Uh, just overheating a little bit. Um, yeah, so... You get a girlfriend. I know, never happened to you. I know it never happened to you. But think of, imagine you got a new girlfriend. This, I'm just kidding. I know you're all very handsome men and beautiful women, right? There are beautiful women watching this as well. I know you have a very good, uh, you, you are a very good person and you are a catch. I know that. But let's assume, for example, you get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, etc. You get this six months of honeymoon period. You're just totally in love with this person. You can't spend a single second without them and then you spend a bit more time with this person and suddenly you realize some actually i can't spend time without this person you get used to them and then you start to get annoyed at them right troubles start to happen and you, then you realize your relationship really is getting tested right and it is through these tests that whether the relationship can work or not is actually properly um understood so once you realize that and, and apply that to that analogy to, you know, be overzealous is that think of it as, you know, you're, you're zealous, but you don't have knowledge, right? So it'll look, it'll look beautiful. Everything will look cool. You know, you will be firing with zeal for the Lord. And then a couple of months later, you're going to be, you're going to start having doubts and questions. Your faith is going to be tested. Praying will seem like a major task and you, you're not going to want to do it, right? And this is why I tell people, for example, if you're new, my biggest advice, instantly make a prayer habit, make a habit, because if you don't make a habit from the beginning, it, it sure as heck is not going to like, it's going to be very difficult to have it after that period is over. Trust me, it's going to be very difficult. You don't want to go through that period. Don't go through that period. Um, so... Uh, I'm a bit tired today, so when I'm tired, my memory goes haywire, so sometimes I immediately forget what I was going to talk about, but to dial back a little bit, <clears throat> you want your zeal to be tempered, you want to be balanced, and you want to have knowledge, and again, when I say these things, I don't say it in a derog derogatory manner, but let me say some things that I see online really annoys me and wants, makes me want to beat you, okay? And I, yeah, yeah, when I'm saying that, of course, in, in the Western world, of course, you say that, it's like, oh, this guy's going crazy. But it's like, when you say it here, that's like a normal thing, right? Anyways, cultural differences, am I right? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it re really makes me angry. So, uh number one is that when i see people who like just come to the server and all they do is like ask questions and like talk about different debates they're having elsewhere and like asking them to like do your debate so like you're basically debating another person through an intermediary and you didn't even ask for that you're just trying to answer help this guy but this guy is using you for his debate so that's a very disrespectful way to look at people first of all it's a very disrespectful way to look at people it's like Oh, I have a problem. Please, please help me uh, protect my ego. That's not a correct way to do things. When you, what you're supposed to do is that if you have, maybe you discuss with someone and someone challenges you and you tell them, look, I'm new to the faith. I can help you uh, point you to the direction, but I am a baby. 
I cannot fully help you right now, but I'll try to defend myself as the best to my abilities. And if that doesn't convince you, then I don't know, see it cope and cry, I guess, because it convinces me. <laughs> and if you want to just try to convince me so much, then, you know, do I have the time to give you to do that? Because I personally don't. You see, I don't have the time to give a random person to lecture me on something that they probably don't know anything about, right? So you also need to think of it this way. This way. Does someone online who uses a lot of big words, do people online who use a lot of big words, who cite a lot of words, do they actually really know these things? Or are they just repeating what they heard from someone else? You need to realize that, okay? Um, so the reason why I come across as if I know things is because I actually do read these books, right? So when I cite something, I can cite them off memory, I can cite the exact pack chapter, I can, not the exact chapter, but like the context, what the book is talking about. I mean, but even then I will say, call myself super knowledgeable because I won't be able to write a PhD thesis on anything right now, right? Um, I guess like maybe, we'll see, maybe, I mean, if I if there was a gun point to my head, you never know, someone can go super beast mode. But, um, you know, jokes aside, um, you cannot really respect everyone with your time constantly, right? Not everyone that's going to challenge you and bring an argument you never heard about is going to actually have a good argument. So, for example, um, the Council of Florence argument. I never heard of it until I was Orthodox for a year. And then when I heard of it, I realized the argument is just like, for you know, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, Council of Florence argument, that's so crazy. Well, how do I answer to this question? Wow, what the heck? But I just sat and looked at it and I just realized, wait a second. So wait, let me understand this argument. So you're saying that there's a council between Rome and the Orthodox. And most bishops, except for one from the Orthodox side, accepted the union. And then this union wasn't applied to the Orthodox Church. And this somehow proves Roman Catholicism. Like when you think of it that way. Dude, are you stupid? Like, how is that a good argument? That's a gypsy-like argument. If I were to borrow a terminology from Saint Alexis Tov, he calls these arguments gypsy-like arguments. I mean, that's a stupid argument. It's a fundamentally idiotic argument. But a lot of people get stressed by it. Why? Because they never knew about Council of Florence. They never knew about their history. They don't really have much of a clue about how ecclesiology works. And so they think that Oh, it was accepted by all Orthodox, right? So when I first learned about it, I didn't know that it wasn't even accepted by any patriarch at all. I, when the way it was told to me by Roman Catholics, I, it made me assume, and really it wasn't assumed, the way they said it's like, oh, well, the entire Orthodox world accepted it. That's a historical, that didn't happen. But again, these people will use big words, they will cite sources, they will cite events that are very rare and obscure, but they will still misrepresent these events. And so when you realize about them, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to get mad at them. You should be mad at yourself. Why did you respect a random stranger and gave them your time and just said, oh, well, I guess you have a good point without like actually researching it yourself, spending time for it yourself. Why? Why did you do that? What made you think a stranger online has a good idea about this topic? Seriously, check yourself, dude. Just because someone uses big words, they're not a big deal. And overzealous people, they miss this because um, they either disrespect them outright or they just like ended up thinking, oh, well, maybe everything I knew wasn't so true, right? And they just get end up like hitting their head to a freaking brick wall and the brick wall doesn't break. And they're just thinking, maybe hmm, I don't want to buy a helmet, but my head is going to break. That's basically what you're thinking. That's basically the situation you're putting yourself in. Um, another issue I want to talk about with being overzealous is that you get freaking annoying, okay? Um, when you when you talk with your parents, again, I see you guys, okay? I see you guys because I saw myself doing this too, but I see you guys. You get excited. You think to yourself, this religion is perfect. This religion is freaking perfect. I need to spread this to everyone. Everyone surely is going to think this religion is perfect. And so you try to explain it. And then you notice your parents are like, Huh? Right? Like, what the heck are you talking about? Are you in a cult? Well, that's what they're going to say, right? They, 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 because a parent is going to see that. They're going to get worried because they're going to think, this guy is getting super obsessive about this. Like, this is abnormal. Like, they're going to they're gonna be scared. And of course, they're going to be afraid. 
because they're they're coming to a new territory where you're super enthusiastic about it and they just don't know what you're going to do because the fact is your parents and some of the people around you are not going to trust you. They're not going to trust you to make the right decision, okay? So they don't think that you're going to be able to make the right decision. And so they will end up taking extreme measures and they will say, no, you're not allowed to go to church, right? You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to, oh, stop crying. It's just a phase. You're going through a phase. A lot of people really do act obnoxious, right? They act obnoxious with their friends. Um, so what I do personally, what I do is not perfect, first of all. It's not the perfect thing. It's what I do because of various different reasons I'm not, you know, get, go into. Um, I'm sure everyone has their own personal reasons why they are the kind of a person they are. But, for example, when I hang out with my friends who are not Orthodox, do I talk about Orthodox Christianity? Yes, I do. Do I give parallels between a situation like maybe like, oh, you know, this reminds me of a quote from Elder So-and-so, right? It's like really relevant to this. Like it's actually relevant. You know, yeah, I do that. But do I like go like try to like debate people and say, you know, why are you not Orthodox? And it's like, that? like I don't do that because I, because, you know, when I hang out with my friends, I want to have a good time. I want to have a good time. I want to enjoy their company and I want to just be happy. I don't want to, you know, be depressed. I don't want to um, be stressed. I don't want to hate my friends. I don't want to think ill of them. And so until I can get into a state where I can genuinely be able to have these conversations without falling into passion and genuinely have these conversations in a proper manner that does not cause them st stumbling and to a stage where I can actually answer, you know, every single question that can potentially come up to me. Um, you know, I'm a perfectionist personally. Um, I basically decided unless I am asked to, I don't speak. Sometimes I'm asked, I speak because they gave me the, they gave me the okay. Um, they don't speak. I don't assume that they want me to. So I think that's the general rule that you want to do. You don't want to hide your faith. Hiding your faith is actually quite simple, but you don't also want to flaunt it to people, right? You don't want to be obsessive about it. Um, you, you don't want to like, um, like, I, I, let me think of examples. I can think of examples. I can't really think of examples right now, but um, there's a lot of radical things sometimes people do against like, oh, well, you know, th there's a very big lack of tact, right? Um, if you go tell your friend that like, yeah, in, in this matter of something of crucial importance, you are totally wrong. Like if you say it directly like that, he's not going to be receptive, right? But if you say it in regard, well, this is what I believe then he might be receptive. Maybe he's not receptive. Maybe he might not be, but he might be. Now, in terms of online people I see and debate servers, I take a very different approach because it's a debate server. Okay, it's a debate server. The, the, the roles are very different, right? It's a debate conversation. So I'm going to be, I'm not going to be talking to you like you're my friend, okay? Um, in fact, you're going to be closer to me as a opponent than a friend, pretty much. Um, but anyways, that's one of the things that I want to go into. Another thing is that, I suppose, is that what, this is another annoying thing that people do that are new to orthodoxy, that is LARPy territory, is that these people try to make themselves authorities. Now, it sounds very ironic that I'm the one saying that. Why? Well... I was baptized merely more than three years ago. So by Orthodox standards, I'm still a newborn baby, right? Really, unless you're like being Orthodox for like 10 years, that's like when you stop being new, right? It's like kind of like bodybuilding too. Like if you might be bodybuilding for a year, you're still going to be a noob, right? By like most standards. But um, obviously there is instances where there are exceptions and such. I'm not denying that. There's historically that that's historically the case. But a lot of people I've noticed is that they want to be the next Jay Dyer. They want to be the next David Abhan. They want to be the next Seraphim Hamilton. They want to be the next XYZ person. They want to be like the next big guy. And so they, they give that air about themselves. But they're new. The chrism on their forehead is still dry and they still try to become authorities, right? And a lot of people do this. A lot of people seek out to try to do this. You're just not ready, okay? You, you. I'll be completely honest. Like I don't know the best way to say this, 
and it will sound ridiculously um, prideful. But you're just not like you're just not built like I am. Like that's like I like I can be humble and say you know like like humble, pride signal humble and say well you know it's just a you know yeah it's it's the Lord yeah but it is the Lord right it is the Lord but it's because me personally um, I think I am just genuinely a smart person. If I didn't think that way, why will I try to help people explain difficult concepts, right? Like it's like saying uh, I'm 80 IQ, but I'm going to teach uh, you know advanced calculus. You, you, I don't think you have the facilities to be able to do that if you're 80 IQ. Right? You don't have the facilities to do that, and some people don't have the facilities to be able to do certain things. And that's fine. That is respectable. But uh, there's a lot of people that are unable to do. It. They literally like don't even have sentience and i'm not i mean i'm saying this in a colloquial sense they don't have sentience and they act like free thinkers like people who say i'm a free thinker i am a free thinker <laughs> i'm a free thinker you're not a free thinker you're just a chronic masturbator who thinks you're so cool you're not a free thinker you're not a cool guy you're pathetic that's what you are um so some people you know exceptions or maybe long-standing you know, persons, they're just built different, right? You're not going to be like them. You should not tr ever try to be like that next guy. You should never try to, like someone, for example, um, told me, oh, David, the way you explain certain things, like Jay died, it's like, the first thing I thought was like, you. And it's not because, like, it's, it's not negative towards him. It's because to, it's towards myself. It's like, I don't want to be like someone else. I want to be like myself. I want people to say, you're like David, like to others. Like, you know, I want to be in, a, you know, I want to be in that situation, for example. You should be the, in that situation too. You should think that way too. It's not just me. You should think that way too. You shouldn't think of yourself as, I'm going to, I'm going to pretend to be Ryan Gosling from Drive. I mean, it's a funny joke. It's like, oh, my new personality come out. But it's like, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't like adopt, you know, someone else as your template and try to be like them. You should unironically be yourself. Even if no one likes you, you should unironically be yourself. But again, being yourself is very different from, well, you know, is your negative, are your negative attributes part of yourself? Purely negative attributes, they're not, right? So you need to also think of, because sin, for example, is non-existent. It's not an actual subsistence characteristic in us. Sin is a corruption of us. And so evil, bad characteristics of your personalities are like that too. They're only part of your personality if you adopt them as part of your personality, but they're not genuinely part of your personality. So remember that too. Um, really, the, your personality is the person God you know, wants you to be. That's what you are. And you have to, you know, you have to cooperate with God in order to achieve that. So you need, so it's about you. So you, you're not gonna be the next Jada, you're not gonna be the next me. Okay, I understand you want to be like me, you want to be handsome, you want to be smart, you want to have obviously good genetics. Okay, I don't have good face genetics, but I'm working on it, you know, um, but you're not going to have good genetics like me. You're not going to have as, as a strong of a cultural background, you're not going to have that ice cold personality that I have where I can manage difficult situations without complaining and bitching to everyone, right? You're not going to have any of these things. But you have certain things that I will never be able to have that I wish that I could have, right? And so that's that's what a person is. A person, you know, personhood really is just the mode of existence of an of you know the mode of existence where the the existence of that nature and its particularizing properties exist in a unique manner. You are the a unique existence of a human being. You are yourself something that I will never be able to become, right? And more people need to understand that. And, you know, men especially need to understand that. And that lack of a core identity is the fundamental cause in why a lot of these people act generally the same. They, they want to be like their hero. You're never going to be like your hero. But I, I've spent too much time on this on this area specifically. And you're not going to be a hero part but it really, it it really is. Um, it uh, it really is that way. Uh, so uh, 
All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When when you got uh, when you got too many views, usually chat ends up becoming worthless. But um, like, why am I uttering such cruel words? Because I'm a cruel person. Is that what you want to hear? Or because cruel words? Because it's like normal for me. Like it's I'm part of that culture. It's like normal for me. If you can't get used to that, I'm sorry. But what, but like, for example, in my church, a lot of what people deem cruel is said towards, you know, me by my priest, for example. And I don't feel bad about it, right? Because I understand it comes from a place of, look, it's just a, it's just, you know, a general orthodox thing. So, and I, and I obviously said before that, that whatever I'm saying, it's not with a bad intent. It's not me trying to derog derogate you. I mean, but like even people who are not like super intelligent, like myself, you can obviously become much better than I ever will be, for example. Maybe, you know, that's possible. Uh, there are many saints that are less intelligent than I am, and I wish I was like them. So uh, I think that's that's kind of the next advice I want to talk about. Intelligence is not everything. You need to understand that intelligence is really not everything. We, we really think that intelligence is the one thing that defines everything. It's like, if you have a certain IQ level, you can build civilizations and you can conquer everything and blah, 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 blah. That's not true. That's fake. There's a lot more valuable things than IQ. Uh, for example, I was on a date with a girl. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm a fake cell. It's not a date. I was out with a girl. Okay. I was going out with a girl and uh, she's telling me, about this village in some Balkan country. And she tells me, oh, you know, there, there's this village in this in this Balkan country. And uh, it's, you know, the people are so nice. They don't even know what gossip means. These people are insanely nice. They are the best kinds of people. They're very saintly people. And I just love them, they're amazing. But then, he, then she says, you know, I don't want society to be like that village. She said, and I'm like, why? Well, like, I thought these are really good people. Why do you not like want more people to be like? Oh, I was like, oh well, ah uh, well, they're like too, you know, they're too old, you know, like they're like mm, they don't they don't let like their girls to go to college. They just marry them when they hit eighteen, and you know they just live in their house. They don't leave their place. They're just content with what they had. They all they do the same thing every day. It's like, and and I'm just listening. It's like, well. And like deep inside, like, you know what I want to say deep inside? Deep inside, I want to say, you lost your dang mind, girl. Like, what the heck is you talking about? I just want to leave right there. Because I was like, this this girl is not for me. Uh, this girl will ruin my life. I can't be with someone like this. But again, I'm a nice guy. And I kind of just weakly said, um, well, you know, there are many things in life that are much better than being intelligent, don't you think? Like being educated. There's, there's, a, there's things in life that are just much more important than being educated. And she just tells me, mm, no, I mean, what are you going to do when you get sick? What are you going to do when you have this XYZ problem? And at that stage, I was like, I guess you're right. <laughs> like, but, you know, really, it was just more like, like, you, I can't, like, I'm too bad to help. Like, I can't help you out. I am unable to help you out. I can't, right? Because I know that if I start to, like, tell you something, I probably get angry at you. And I don't want to do that. So I just kind of like, okay. I'll let you have this. Um, but really, it kind of, kind of goes to show that everyone is overly fixated on intelligence and education. But really what matters in life is living a godly, saintly life. That's the number, thing, number one thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters, okay, is living a Christ-like life. It's the number one thing that matters, all right? So intelligence, being educated, being... High, good genetics, having good genetics and all of these things. These are all burdens, all right? These are all just burdensome things. Intelligence is a burden. Having good genetics is a burden. Being handsome is a burden. All of these things, material things, are a burden on us. What really matters is God. That's the only thing that lightens our burden. So that's the other thing that I want to talk about, is that you don't need to be in a competition about being zealous. You don't mean need to be in a competition about I'm the most zealous guy. I'm the best guy. Um, I I got to be 
pious. I got a piety signal, right? A lot of people do that. They got they feel the need to show their piety to the outside world. They need to show people that they're super pious and that they are, you know, that they are just that you are the perfect Christian. And that everyone else around you is a meanie. They're not probably and you feel the need to correct everyone you see around you. Cut that out, okay? It's freaking annoying. It's freaking annoying. It's seriously annoying. It doesn't help anymore, okay? When I get someone saying, like, even here, like, even in the chat, and, like, I'm not saying this to, like, humiliate someone or anything like that. Like, maybe they can, they, they think that way. I'm sorry for that. But, like, I had to... People learn from public examples, right? So, you know, like, when someone says, oh, why are you being so cruel, right? Like, what do you expect someone to say like think think of it that way like what do you expect them to say do you expect them to say oh well yeah you're right yeah you're right I'm, I'm a cruel person lord forgive me a sinner lord forgive me a sinner do you expect me to do that i'm not gonna do that dude if i'm gonna do that i'm gonna cut this like i'm gonna do that after i cut the stream that's when i'm gonna do that but at that stage i don't want you to know about that no one should know about that because no every, anyone else's piety that ain't your business it's not your business, okay? And that's what people don't realize, is that they think that other people's piety is somehow their business, that they somehow have the right to, like, tell them that you got to do this, you got to do that. Why are you being like this? Why are you being like that? They're, it's not your business. Seriously. It's seriously not your business, okay? Unless you have an authority over them, it's not. So I specifically try not to, for example, like, tell this guy is not pious, this guy's like... My critiques never go to that level. Maybe I want to protect myself. Maybe it might have slipped on the off chance. In that case, I'm obviously wrong and I'm obviously contradictory and, 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 and hypocritical. But I try not to do that. Why? Because, again, their piety is not something. But if someone signals fake piety, well, that's obviously something very different. That's something they're trying to delude people. They're trying to trick people into thinking that there's some spiritual guru. Right. And this is the main problem that I have with a lot of people today is the spiritual guruism. So and so Bishop said we need to wear face diapers. OK, like, are you going to just like kneel on them and kiss their feet every time they say something and just say, yeah, yeah, everyone should do it. Yeah, yeah you're my bishop. This is you. Or are you going to say, I respect your authority. Um, all right. If you want me to wear it in your church. I, I'm going to follow that protocol, but, you know, the moment you slip, eh, you know, because because what you're doing is ridiculous, right? And that's kind of like what, like, Eastern culture is a lot like that, right? Like, when, the, when someone in authority says something, like, orders something stupid, the people listening usually are like, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, we got this, we got this. And then when they leave, it's like, okay, we're not doing this, right? That's, the first, that's instantly what they do. And... It's, it's actually quite lindy and it's quite quite traditional because that's kind of how you're supposed to, you still respect their authority, but you also are saying, well, this is obviously morally wrong and I cannot do this. Now, face type is a, is a different example, but you can you give various different examples. Um, uh, Master Tech, I hope you're referring to my sorry attempt at a joke. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. If if it was a joke, then it's. I think it's my. No, it's my. You're good. You're good. You're good, Master Tiger. It's not a problem. Um. I like. Uh, I know people. It's difficult. I know the excuse of like it's difficult to convey jokes from a text is a is a, a very. How should I say? It's a popular excuse, but like um, I should probably have paid more attention. So, sorry. Uh, it's not a problem. You're good. But it still it still stands, right? The kind of criticism still stands because uh, I see a lot of people, like for example, recently, um, I, someone tried to say, "Oh, you're a liar, and uh, you're a liar. You're you're spreading false things about someone." And I was like, "You know, I'm making jokes about a popular person." So, oh, so you say you're being ironic? I thought you guys you hated being ironic. It's like. Okay, but like, I have the right to be able to joke a little bit sometimes about popular people. Other people are allowed to joke about me a little bit sometimes. Okay, it's not a, you know, you're allowed to say Turk Roach to me. It is a joke. 
Like you can say that. I don't think it's funny, but you can say that. I'm not going to ban you from my chat for saying that or anything like that. But um, but it's like, and then it's like, oh, you were in some group chat, and it's like, oh, you should apologize for slandering someone. It's like, and like in that group chat, like there was slander against that person I didn't like. I was that I was the one person in that group chat who said, hey guys, maybe this is not true. <laughs> maybe this is not true actually. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into details, but like uh, basically a fake account in person is someone else and and posted something questionable. And everyone you jumped onto, and I was like, mm, "Is there actual proof, or are we just assuming this?" And I said, "Well, if it's just if you're just assuming it, then leave me out of that. I'm not going to assume that. I don't need I don't need to make up reasons to dislike this person, you know. So why will I bother with that? And for me, it's not even disliking that person. It's just that again, jokes. Eventually, I got bored, and I'm not." That was my phone. That was my phone laughing at me. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> but that example, again, it really shows you. Imagine that happening to you. You just acting normally, just being yourself. And someone just comes up to you and say, you can't do this. You're not allowed to do this. It's going to piss you off. Okay. It's going to make you angry. You know who's supposed to do that? Your priest. Your priest is supposed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. You can't do that. But this does not mean, this not, does not give you license to act any way that you want. I hope you understand as overzealous LARPy converts that you have to sometimes watch your language in acting. Sounds hypocritical saying for me, but me, it's a personality thing. I don't think you have my, I'm just kidding. But um, uh, the final thing I want to say connected to this is just general meanness, right? Um, most criticisms of Orthodox Christians being mean is a joke it's a meme it's not real it's not a real thing it's fake it's an excuse but are there instances of people really being mean that are orthodox yes understand that not every person is going to respond to you in the same manner okay you being yourself to a random woman online who's a normie is probably not going to be a good showing for her it's gonna think she's gonna think you are being totally ridiculous and eventually it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy and now we don't want that now do we no we don't so i will say the most important thing out of this is humility zeal without humility is uncontrolled fire if you do not have a recognition of your weakness and of your true incapability and inability to be able to do nor understand certain things, if you do not recognize that, then you will never be at a stage where you become capable of doing the things that you were incapable of doing before. Never. Humility is the number one thing that allows you to learn. I'm not saying every learned person is a humble person, but every learned person went through that stage of humility. Every single one of them, every single one of them went through that stage. I'm not saying they're humble now at the end process, but through that process, and in some capacity, they were. Because remember, what is humility, right? Well, we're supposed to learn about our faith. We're supposed to learn about ourselves. Learning. What does learning presuppose? Learning presupposes that there is someone telling you things that you don't know about. There's someone teaching you things and lecturing you on things that you don't know much about, that you know less about. If you're not humble, here's what happens. You think that you know more than the person telling you what to do. And if you assume that you know more than the people telling you what to do, why would you listen to them? It's a very simple question. Why would you listen to them? If you're not humble, that is, if you don't assume that you're lesser than that person in that capacity, specific capacity in that topic, then you're never going to learn anything. You're never going to progress. You're never going to achieve anything. You are going to stagnate. Straight line stagnate. And I'm talking fundamentally stagnate, right? You might learn new things somewhere, but you're just going to stay here. All right. You're not going to go up just this straight line. 
and eventually it's a downward spiral when you get older because when we get older we, we start to decline a little bit right um so avoid that don't get into that situation and you should be fine and that's what i would like to conclude my video with because at that stage i'm going to enter rambling zone and i don't want to bore your time to watch this this stream should have ended 30 minutes ago to be honest even at this stage i feel like i've said some things that i kind of regret saying but uh it's fine anyways uh I will end this video, I will end the stream, and I will first say, um, all right, and I'll see you in the next stream. Uh, before I go, uh, RE Book Reviews says $5, respect the advice, thank you for the $5 donation, and I will see all of you in the next video. Thank you for watching this, and... I will see all of you 